Well, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Leslie Chan. Leslie uh, is Associated Professor in Critical Development Studies at the University of, of Toronto, Scarborough, Canada. Uh, he's Director of the Interactive Research Network, uh, Research Lead at the Knowledge Equity Lab, and he is uh, an outstanding specialist in political economy of knowledge. So thank you very much, uh, Leslie, for being here. And I would like to start with one first question. Um, based on the international initiatives and the way to transform research assessment system, which strategies seems most promising to you? And what do you see as the main challenges? Thank you, Laura, for the invitation uh, to engage in this panel on research assessment, which I think is a very timely and important contribution. Uh, with regard to your question, in terms of uh, international initiatives on research assessment, uh, I'm sure many uh, uh, people in the audience are familiar with the DORA Declaration on Research Assessment, uh, the, the Leiden Manifesto for Research Metrics, and then the, also the EU policy for responsible research and innovation. Um, and what is interesting about these sort of high-level declarations is that they, they all share one thing in common, and that is they urge uh, evaluation of people who do evaluations to move away from the simplistic use of metrics uh, particularly the journal impact factor as a way to evaluate quality of research. And all these declarations uh, also call for multiple approaches to thinking about uh, uh, research eva evaluation and think about disciplinary differences in research practices so that th there is not one, uh, one size fits all approach that could be applied to all, all research uh, in all areas. Uh, and that uh, what the EU policy also remind the word responsible research remind us is that again, there's, there is, there is these, these evaluation have very serious consequences because uh, if, if it's not done right, it would favor certain kind of, of, of uh, research and evaluation method over others. And, and we know that in the past, there's been a lot of uh, inequities built into these uh, evaluation system that they have tend to favor certain type of research, so-called international uh, research in particular type of journals have high impact factors. Uh, and if we if if you continue with that kind of uh, uh, focus, uh, you tend to uh, uh, ignore or make invisible a lot of uh, other research that are equally important. Uh, so that system has to be responsible for making sure that um, that there is fairness a, a in the system uh, in terms of the evaluation. Uh, so to me, these kind of common common um, common goals is is encouraging. Uh, uh, but uh, as you mentioned, what are the challenges? And the challenge, of course, is that uh, the the journal impact factors and the traditional bibliometrics. Uh, that are being promoted by uh, by Web of Science and Scopus, uh, all these multinational companies. Uh, these metrics has become so ingrained in, in researchers' uh, mindset uh, and institutional uh, practices. Uh, it is it is hard to to move away from these uh, the, from these uh, practices, particularly when when research culture is still very much driven by this uh, so-called publish and perish uh, paradigm. Uh, uh, so, 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 that, so that's really what, one of the major challenges. I would like to ask you in your opinion, from which perspectives and experiences institutions and actors from the global south could contribute to the international conversation on research assessment reform? Okay, great. So, um, Interestingly, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Ministry of Education in China uh, published uh, a, a 
join a some policy uh, uh, paper rethinking about research evaluation uh, in China. Uh, China, of course, has grown very rapidly in the last 20 years in terms of global uh, scientific publishings. In fact, in scope, as China's publications probably now exceeds that of the United States. Uh, but the reason these ministries uh, are calling for a rethinking of uh, research assessment is because uh, Chinese institutions and, and, and scientists in the last two decades have been socialized into this journal impact factors and, and high publication output as the metrics of, of success. Uh, and they're seeing that there are a lot of problems that came from this sort of drive to, to, to publish more in high ranking journal and international journal in English uh, journals to, to be indexed and so forth. Uh, the, the, the consequences is a lot of important local regional research uh, are not being uh, pay attention to in the same way as these so-called internationally, uh, I guess, um, uh, known topics or the hot topics, so to speak. And so they realize a lot of regional research have been neglected and a lot of um, local and regional journals has been around for some time, published in Chinese, uh, have also been neglected. Uh, so they want to rethink, uh, 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 you know, how this, uh, this, this sort of addiction, they actually call this addiction to the, the journal impact factor or the, the web of science. Uh, they want to kind of move away from that and to, to refocus on promoting uh, a better balance uh, of local uh, and international research. And also at the same time uh, to, and I quote, promote the return of universities to their original academic aims. Uh, that is universities should be also there to serve societal needs uh, and not simply uh, uh, institutions uh, gaining reputation for the sake of gaining uh, reputations. Uh, so I, I've been following this development. I think it's encouraging from a global South perspective uh, because again, we, we, we have countries uh, like China's rethinking uh, research assessment that are I think relevant to many other parts of the world uh, that there are important regional research being done uh, everywhere. Uh, and Latin America of course is uh, in many countries and Latin America leaders in uh, many different areas of research, uh, and of course in in the open movement as well. So, so that this think about rebalancing the local and the global uh, is something that I think um, is a very important uh, lesson to remember, uh, and also a, 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 a reminder that that indeed there's a great deal of diversity uh, in knowledge systems around the world. Uh, and and the, the 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 key focus on only publishing in high impact journals have tended to uh, ignore that that heterogeneity, that diversity of research and uh, from around the world. So I think it's time to to rethink you know, what some would call bibliodiversity uh, uh, and uh, different knowledge system in this global and local uh, kind of uh, interactions. So very interesting, the, the experiences that you mentioned. And coming back to the focus on university, in one of your recent papers, in collaboration with George Chen, you have studied the relationship between university rankings and governance through the lens of the global academic publishing industry dynamic. Could you comment on the main findings of the study and based on the results what recommendations would you make to university authorities and managers in Latin America and the Caribbean regarding the use of these rankings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um, so the research that we did on uh, the relationship uh, between the publishing uh, company uh, and the ranking uh, industry uh, was to show that uh, uh, again, uh, these these businesses, these these very highly lucrative businesses, are taking advantage uh, of the fact that university 
uh, are dependent on uh, these publishers uh, to get their research output uh, indexed uh, and uh, recognized internationally. So on the one hand, they're driving this this uh, this this addiction to journal ranking and all that. Uh, on the other hand, they're also using these same kind of publishing data uh, to feed into university rankings. Uh, uh, these so-called uh, world-class university uh, is becoming another way to drive uh, this reputation competition among universities uh, around the world. And so uh, if you want to receive, well, if you want to do well in these international ranking, it is often said by these company, then you should be publishing in these kind of uh, venues because that will get you more uh, credit in order to feed into the ranking. So, so they are doing uh, both these uh, uh, both sides of uh, both the promotion of the publishing and the promotion of the ranking at the same time, and often done by the same people. Uh, so Elsevier's have been very good, as of course everybody knows Elsevier is a publishing company, but in fact our research and other people's research have shown, and the company themselves has said they're not just a publishing company, they are actually a data analytic company. And the, their big part of their big business these days is really about data uh, accumulation data access and generating new kind of um, uh, services and, and uh, products in terms of research intelligence, what they call research intelligence. Uh, then they sell these research intelligence back to the universities uh, who can afford to buy them uh, because these universities are promised uh, promise that if they use these intelligence uh, uh, that are given to them or, or that, there's, that, that they purchase, that they will again improve in their ranking uh, as a result. Um, so they're trying to push this idea of, of, uh, uh, of, of ranking as a way to drive production and use production as a way to, to uh, support ranking. Uh, and we want to show in the research uh, that uh, we need to be asking a lot of questions uh, about uh, how these companies are taking advantage of public resources, the public funding of the university, the, pub, the labor of the academics in, in, in writing and doing research, how they are able to take all our, our public resources and our labor and turn them into uh, uh, valuable commodities that they then trade and sell, not just to, to these uh, academic uh, company, but to companies and to other businesses beyond the academia. Uh, so we want to raise question about these kind of, of, of businesses. Uh, and, and the other big uh, uh, point that we want to make in, 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 this, in this research is also to remind uh, us that increasingly as these big data uh, driven uh, uh, products are being made, a lot of these products are also uh, driven by algorithms that are written by these companies that are non-transparent to the users. So, so increasingly, there are a lot of research that are being done in many areas uh, um, that how algorithms are, are built in biases can severely affect the way we think about you know, uh, equities and qualities in, in society. Uh, and by the same token, a lot of these algorithms that are non-transparent to us are driving decision-making uh, of university who are using these system without really asking questions about who are writing these algorithms with what data and who has oversight and governance of these uh, of these um, things that are being written into our infrastructure. So our research was really again intend to raise question about uh, why we should have questions about governance of these data and algorithms. Uh, that are now increasingly controlling our uh, research practices and behavior and institutional culture. One of the one of the thing that we I think around the world, as I said, uh, these so-called world-class university ranking are being pushed on different university around the world, uh, including Latin American countries. And the same powerful entities that sell these analytics are the one that is pushing for university to adopt these kind of uh, idea, right? And uh, 
to the point where I know a lot of universities are, are putting in their strategic plan how they're going to increase their world ranking and so forth, or get into the world ranking of one way or the other. And to me, that those are really poor uh, policy guide, guidance, if, if they can call them as policy guidance at all, because again, they're a commercial agenda uh, disguised as a public policy agenda. So I would say whether, whether it is Latin America or, or anywhere else in the world, this, this, the same kind of question needs to be asked. Who, who are pushing these agenda? Who are supposed to benefit from these kind of practices? Uh, and, and why we should really ask questions and resist them? And, and I know actually Latin American university, many of them have consciously resisted uh, over the years of being of taking part in these kind of so-called uh, world rankings. They consciously resisted them and I, I applaud them. But again, there is such strong push uh, by these commercial company often directly going to the ministries, government high level uh, uh, officials uh, who do not understand a lot of these, uh, these uh, issues uh, in detail uh, they, they get so these messages about, oh, yeah, increasing your country's uh, university's reputation. What's wrong with that? Right. So they don't ask the right kind of question. Uh, so so I would say, uh, again, no matter where your university is, is located, just need to ask question about uh, who is in charge of these kind of ranking. Uh, these are all private company that somehow have this humongous power to tell university, public universities, uh, how they should be practicing, uh, you know, in terms of focus on research and, and uh, evaluations and so forth. So, so we need to ask questions and we, we need to resist these. So to me, open science is really about uh, uh, moving away from this uh, fake notion of competition uh, and remind ourselves that science is really a, a social enterprise, a collaborative enterprise uh, that involves many different actors. Uh, they're not just the elite uh, uh, institutions and the expert either. So to me, open science is also about opening knowledge making and sharing and, 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 and stewardship to the communities, right? The local communities are the kind of local relevance that I spoke about earlier. So that around the world, again, we have many different indigenous community, traditional communities that know a lot about uh, food security, sustainability of the environment and uh, circular economies, practices uh, and infrastructures uh, of different kind that care for individuals and communities. Uh, open science is about learning from all of them and allowing all these knowledge to be part of the scientific system uh, and to, to move away from competition to uh, these kind of uh, broad scale participation. Uh, so at the same time, it is a great reminder that science is not exclusively, as I said, for, for the elite and for the special, uh, but we all take part in, in knowledge making and production and that these kind of uh, 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 that become also a social justice issue because a lot of knowledge historically, as we know, has been marginalized uh, for these structural reasons. And so open science to me is about opening up these barriers to understand that knowledge system can learn from each other, can, can enrich it, each other, uh, and, and we will all be better for it if we, if we do so. And so that will have implication for a research evaluation, right? Because it's, again, it, it forces us to rethink, you know, who's doing research, who's benefiting from the research. And it is really about uh, the broad benefit that we should really thinking about real impact, right? If, if, if you only have a lot of citation, but no one actually care about how those research is, is affecting community, that's not real impact. But there are a lot of great research that have real societal impact, but have no citation. Uh, how do we make sure that we include these important research as part of our assessment? Great, Leslie. Thank you so much for your contribution, your words, your thoughts that will nourish the, the debate in this international colloquium of Polec and in the ninth uh, conference of Claxo.
So we appreciate very much your your participation. Thank you. And thank you for for having me. And uh, uh, and I wish I could be there to join you, but I'm sure that I will follow online some of the conversation. Um, and wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very much, Leslie.